Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the RTA's webinar on starting a tenancy. My name is Mark Fidler, and I'm from the communication and education team here at the RTA. With me today is Deb Bond, also from the CNE team. Morning, Deb. Good morning, Mark. Thanks very much for joining us. Deb will be helping me do some polls and answer some questions throughout uh, today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this country and their continuing connection with the land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to all traditional owners and to elders past, present and emerging. So today's session will be focused on the scenario topics listed on the slide. We will record the webinar today and it will be made, be made available on the RTA's website within the next week. The information today does include the changes made to the legislation on the 1st of October 2022. We will have a look at your questions as they come through and have a final question and answer session at the end of today. Note, and please note, that the RTA cannot provide legal advice and you are encouraged to seek your own independent advice and to make informed decisions. So to make this an interactive session today, we encourage you to ask questions or make comments throughout. To do so, please use the chat function in the toolbar. At the end of the session, as I mentioned, there will be, um, sorry, there will be a question and answer survey uh, session. Uh, there will also be a quick survey that comes up and we'd appreciate you filling that out as your feedback allows us to identify how we can improve our communication and education activities. We'll also be doing some polls during today's session and we'll start the first one now. I'll hand over to Deb to run a poll. Uh, so the first poll is about uh, who's with us today. So we want to know uh, which group in the rental sector you identify with. Uh, so take a moment to let us know whether you're a property manager or agent, an owner or landlord, tenant or resident, rooming provider or owner, or caravan park manager. Uh, we might have some people in community housing and support. And if you don't fit into any of those categories, just let us know you're uh, something else with, by using other. And also, we're curious to know whereabouts in Queensland you're from. So uh, just having a look at the results that have come through so far. So it uh, looks like most of the people today are property owners and landlords, followed by property managers and agents. And uh, most people are from southeast Queensland, but we have a couple of people from central and north Queensland as well. So thank you, everyone, for joining us on the line. Uh, and I'll hand back over to Mark to keep uh, talking us through. Thanks, Deb. All right. So what we want to look at today is starting a tenancy and getting off on the right foot. So the first thing that we need to look at is what our legislation does cover. So most of you will be familiar, and obviously with the people that have joined us today, um, property agents and landlords, um, you'll be aware that general tenancies are your houses, uh, flats, units, townhouses, and those um, types of agreements. Movable dwellings, and the legislation does cover those, are for tenancies in caravan parks, and that's whether you rent a van or a site, or both in the park. These do not include manufactured home tenancies. Moveable dwelling agreements are mainly covered by the same legislation as general tenancies. There's a few differences though around park rules and other matters specific to van parks. Today, um, we also look at rooming accommodation. So where the resident is renting a room only and has shared facilities, such as in a boarding house or purpose-built student accommodation. It's important to acknowledge that terminology is a bit different uh, between general tenancies and rooming accommodation and the timeframes um, are a little bit different and some of the requirements for the tenancy are different as well. Now, the other thing to note with this is that the Act doesn't cover borders and lodges. It doesn't cover education institutions where the accommodation is on campus. We don't cover commercial leases. Uh, the first 13 weeks of the approved supported accommodation or temporary refuge accommodation. So before the tenancy commences, it's important to note that the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act doesn't cover the tenancy selection or application process. 
So we're aware agents and landlords will have different and various methods within their application processes. And it will usually include an identification, uh, identification check, which may include a 100% 100 point, sorry, uh, ID process. It may also ask for references or information to support the tenancy application. The agent or landlord really should be looking for the tenant's ability to care for and maintain the rental property, and also their ability to pay or to afford to pay the rent. Through this process, landlords and managers should also be aware of privacy laws and anti-discrimination laws. Now, our Act does include Section 50H, which states that a prospective tenant must be given a copy of the proposed tenancy agreement before the tenant commits to the tenancy. Now, this is for general tenancies only. Before the tenant commits means that they, before they pay any money or sign the agreement, a proposed agreement should be completed and given to the prospective tenant. In most instances, this will include all of the terms and conditions and be fully completed, probably except for the name and the start date. Now, by giving the tenant the prospective agreement, uh, it'll give them an opportunity to read and understand any of the terms, uh, how rent will be paid, for example, in any special terms. It's also an opportunity for them to clarify any questions that they have uh, prior to the tenancy starting. So in relation to special terms, and I mentioned that, uh, that the proposed agreement must include your special terms, these are negotiable and should be discussed prior to the tenant signing the agreement. They can include details about keeping a pet, could be water charging or even garden requirements. Now the special terms, um, the manager or uh, property owner can't uh, allow or can't require the tenant to leave the property in a better condition than it was at the start of the tenancy. Therefore, you can't require carpets to be steam cleaned, as an example, if that wasn't done before they moved in. You can't require the tenant to purchase goods or services. Now, unless these terms are in relation to you agreeing for pets to be kept at the premises as a part of the application process. Now, I will talk a little bit more about pets uh, and that process, because there have been some changes in the legislation recently. Also, you can't request um, or state a specific bond cleaning or carpet cleaning service, and you can't ask a tenant to pay a set fee for bond cleaning or carpet cleaning. You'll also see a note on the screen regarding contracting outside of the Act. Now, this means that you cannot change the intent of the Act or a standard term of the Act with a special term. For example, you can't change a time frame. So if the Act says that you must provide two months notice, you can't change that to be one month's notice, for example. A couple of other things to be aware of before starting the tenancy, and especially with our current challenges in the market and low vacancy rates. Now, please be, um, be aware that rent must be advertised at a fixed rate. It's okay for a tenant to offer more than the advertised amount, and you can accept that, but you can't then tell other tenants they need to match or offer more again. This might be considered to be rent bidding and is an offence under our legislation. There are also minimum rent in advance amounts that can be requested. Four weeks for fixed tenancies and two weeks rent for periodic tenancies. Now, tenants may offer more. Uh, for example, they may offer the total rent up front. Um, now, this can be accepted, but you can't ask for it. You also should consider if it's the best option for both yourselves and the tenant. Now, in relation to rent payments, if you are offering rent card or another third party arrangement, you must also offer two approved ways to pay rent. Now, approved ways under our legislation include cash, check, or deposit to a financial institution. You cannot specify bank check, and money order is not an approved way. And the other thing with these third party arrangements is that you must ensure that the tenant is aware of any associated costs. Now, if this is either a dollar amount or even a percentage amount, um, it's best to set that out in the agreement or at least have a conversation with the tenant. For example, some, some rent card uh, payments require a percentage amount if the tenant is using credit card. Now, it's all good and well, uh, might look a small amount, but 2.5% credit card surcharge on $500 a week rent adds up to nearly $650 across a year. Now that's more than another week's rent and there could be some concerns from the tenant in that aspect. So it's best practice to ensure that your tenant is well aware of the costs. Now that we've got all of that sorted, 
We've advertised the property, we've found our tenant and they're happy with the agreement and everyone's looking to get the thing started. Now, there's four basic forms required at the start of your tenancy. I'll provide specific details on each of these forms in the um, upcoming slides, but the four forms that you're looking at are your general tenancy agreement. We've talked about that being needed to be filled out um, before the tenant commits. So this will include your standard terms. These cannot be changed and they're outlined under the regulations of the Act. And also we've spoken about the special terms and they should be included in this. The entry condition report, which is your form 1A, and I'll speak about the importance of that in a moment. And the information statement or pocket guide for tenants. Now this can be downloaded from our website uh, and a copy provided to the tenant, or it can be provided to them as a link um, from our website. Uh, so, and the other, form is the bond lodgement form, and I'll touch on lodgement options in a moment. So in relation to all of our forms, it is important that you are using our website to ensure that you've got the most current form, or check that the system that you're using has the most current and correct form information. So we do update our forms, um, so it is important to ensure that you've always got the most current uh, copy. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, once the tenants agreed to take the property, the, uh, the 18A must be signed. So there shouldn't be any surprises at this point because the tenant should have been provided a copy of that before committing to the tenancy and all the standard and special terms should be in there. Copy of the signed agreement must be provided to both parties. Now, there have been some changes to the forms from uh, the 1st of October, the legislative changes, and we'll have a look at those over the next couple of slides. So the changes made uh, on October the 1st of 2022 provide for the tenant to be able to seek a repair order if repairs have not been made to the property. Now information regarding repair orders can be found on our website, uh, including a webinar titled Repair Orders and Other Amendments. Now Deb will drop the link into the chat now for, uh, for, for that information. Now, if there are outstanding repair orders on the property, they must now be stated at five, item 5.3. So if a tenancy ends and there's an outstanding repair order on the property, the details must be included in this section. Now repair orders, it's important to note, are specific to the property, not a tenancy. So that's why uh, this important information needs to be provided. And can I also note, uh, while we're looking at item five, 5.2 refers to inclusions provided at the property. Now you need to be thorough and descriptive in this section. For example, if you've got expensive rubber backed block out curtains on a window, please ensure that you describe them as such. If you just put curtains, you might come back at the end of the tenancy to find cheap calico curtains from Kmart on the windows. If 5.2 just says curtains, then you may have some issues in regards to how that tenancy finishes up. Another change made on the 1st of October was in regards to contact for repairs. Before the 1st of October, the Act says you may list someone in those spots. The Act now says that you must list contact details of who the tenant should contact in an emergency repair situation. If your organisation is the first point of contact, that's okay, as long as the tenant can get hold of someone in an emergency situation. Now, the entry condition report, I mentioned that before, it is important to fill this out clearly and correctly at the start. So the process is as stated on the slide. The agent must fill out and sign the agreement before giving it to the tenant for them to complete. There's also been a change here in that the tenant now has seven days to get that back to you. And that's increased from three as it was before the 1st of October. So it's important to be uh, thorough, attach any documentation or evidence that may be required to support the condition of the property. And we also recommend photos. Now remember that this report is compared to the expedition report at the end of the tenancy. There's a couple of things to note now. The tenant now has seven days from the start of a tenancy to end their tenancy if the premises are not fit to live in, not in good repair, or do not meet laws regarding the health and safety of the property. And from September 1, 2023, if the property doesn't meet minimum housing standards, they will have an option to end the tenancy within seven days. So a properly filled out and accurate entry condition report 
is important as proof of how the property was given to the tenant. The other thing to note here is our dispute resolution service received just under 20,000 disputes last year and nearly 53% of those were in relation to the bond. So good documentation, respectful and regular communication between agents and landlords and the tenants and clear evidence of how the property was at the start of the tenancy can avoid matters escalating to disputes. The information statement, the Form 17A, this form's been around, no, there's been no changes to the legislation in regards to this, but it is a lessor's responsibility to provide a copy of this to the tenant at the start of the tenancy. As I mentioned earlier, it can be downloaded from our website or it can be emailed to the tenant as a PDF. Also to note that these pocket guides are available in a range of other languages. Uh, at the moment, we are working on updating them in relation to the legislation changes. So keep an eye out on our website for when those are actually updated and available again. Now, in relation to the bond lodgement process, if you are taking money from a tenant uh, and sending that to us with a form and a check, you must ensure that that is lodged with us within 10 days. If agents are using um, bulk process in this situation, uh, if you're sending in checks mid and end of month, be aware that that may not meet the 10 day requirement. Otherwise, our web services is a quicker option for either party to lodge the bond. A tenant or agent can use a single bond lodgement and agents can also now lodge bulk bonds with one payment. Now again, for the agents out there uh, that may be looking to use web services, Deb's gonna drop a link into the chat uh, and there's plenty of information to get you started if you're not familiar with that process. And for us to get a bit of an idea on who is using web services, I'll get you to run that poll for me, Deb, just on the use of web services. Yep, so I'm just opening up a poll now. So we're curious to know uh, if you've used any of our web services and which they are. You can tick as many options as you've used. So maybe you've used both our bond refunds and our bond lodgements, whether that's the single or the bulk lodgements. Uh, there's also the dispute resolution requests, the change of bond contributor, the option to update your details. And we do have an option to say that you haven't used our web services yet. There's always time to use them in future. Uh, so I'll just give another moment to answer. Okay, I think most people have answered. So um, yeah probably the most popular ones that people have used. And a few people are ticking multiple options as well. Yeah. Uh, are the single bond lodgements and the bond refunds and uh, quite a few on the change of bond contributor and a few people who haven't used our web services yet. So that's something new to discover. So I'll just end that. Excellent. Okay. Thanks for that, Deb, and thanks for that feedback. All right, so moving forward, in relation to uh, the key processes. So just to recap here, it's important to get everything right at the start. Please double check your dates, amounts, and contact details on all of your forms. We do see a lot of disputes about incorrectly stated rent amounts or incorrect dates for starts and finishes of tenancies. So ensuring that you're checking and double checking those things at the start can avoid a lot of issues. And also, if you're agreeing to receive notices by email, please ensure that any email addresses are correct. Keep a copy of your paperwork and any notices that are issued and ensure that you do comply with the Act throughout the tenancy. As I mentioned before, communication is key to resolving a lot of disputes and clarifying any issues. And if you're not sure of any legislative, have another gap that, any legislative requirements, please reach out to the RTA for assistance and I'll provide some contact details for us shortly. So once the tenancy started, both parties have legislative rights and responsibilities throughout. So I know I've focused today on getting things right at the start, but it is important to be aware of your continuing obligations. Health and safety laws cover things such as smoke alarm, safety switches and pool safety certificates if there is one at the property. And dealing with maintenance requests is also important. Tenants must notify you of repairs that need to be done, and they should be dealt with in a reasonable time frame. As I mentioned earlier, if um, things aren't dealt with, tenants can now seek a repair order. Another change to note with repairs is that the emergency repair, um, if emergency repairs are required uh, and not responded to, the tenant now can spend up to four weeks rent 
uh, and to have the matter rectified and seek reimbursement. The other thing to note too is that I mentioned earlier that minimum housing standards will come in from the 1st of September 2023. So this should be kept in mind when dealing with any maintenance requests. So the tenant has responsibilities just as long uh, as well as the lessor or agent. So as per the list, these are fairly straightforward, certainly in regards to rent payments, um, cleaning and not causing a nuisance by the use of the premises. Uh, and as I mentioned a moment ago, the tenant is required to notify the agent of any repairs that need to be done uh, for both routine repairs and emergency repairs. There must be contact details for the tenant in the agreement of who to notify. And we do encourage tenants to ensure notifications are in writing and a copy kept. And finally, just in regards to pets. Now I mentioned earlier that new pet laws, uh, new laws regarding pets came in on October the 1st, uh, 2022. Now, if you're negotiating with a tenant at the start and through the application process to have a pet, then please ensure that your special terms of the agreement cover this. You can now, as I mentioned earlier, um, ask the tenant for uh, professional uh, carpet cleaning and pest control. The new laws, though, do allow a tenant to apply for a pet once they are in the tenancy, and there's legislated reasons for you to refuse the tenant that request. So for information about that process, please check all of the details on our website. Now Deb's gonna drop a link in um, with a flowchart on the approval process. Tenant is responsible for all nuisance uh, that the pet may cause, such as noise or damages, and damage caused by pets is not fair wear and tear. Now, one thing to note here is that there are some different rules for working dogs or retired working dogs. And these are things like assistance guide or hearing dogs, corrective services dogs or police dogs. A tenant may keep a working dog, that one of those three, uh, at the property without your approval. So to keep yourself up to date, uh, we encourage you to jump on and have a look at our website and the details around pets there. All right, so just uh, as I mentioned, um, the, a lot of information on our website in regards to the legislative changes that we've made. Um, so we would encourage you to uh, jump on and have a look. Make sure that you've signed up for our monthly news uh, email so we can keep you informed of any topics. There is a range of educational resources, including recorded webinars on our legislation and key topics, as well as our Talking Tenancies podcast series. Now, as I said earlier, your feedback on today's webinar will help us continue to improve our communication. So please fill out the short survey that will come up on the screen at the end. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn if you're on LinkedIn. Now, Deb, that's the information that I've got to present today. Do we have any questions uh, there from anyone that uh, need answering? Yeah, so we had some questions about rent in advance. So if you could clarify what the maximum amounts of rent in advance that you can request are, and maybe tell us a bit more about what happens if someone offers more than that. Yeah, okay. So in a fixed term agreement, so if you're signing a fixed term tenancy, you can ask for up to four weeks rent in advance. Uh, if it's a periodic tenancy, then you can't ask for any more than two weeks in advance. Now, the important thing too with the legislation is that it says that um, you can't ask for rent in a period for which rent has already been paid. So if the tenancy starts, let's say for example, on the 1st of November, and the tenant has paid four weeks rent in advance, then their first payment of rent under the agreement will be four weeks after that. So around about the 28th of November. So that initial payment must be used up before they're required to pay rent again. Now in regards to a tenant offering more, in advance, so they can offer more. They can offer, as I said earlier, up to the full amount of the rent for the whole tenancy. The thing is, uh, and as I mentioned, it's important to work out whether that is in your best interest as the lessor or landlord, or even in the tenant's best interest. So if, for example, you know something happens and the tenancy ends early, um, then there might be issues with regards to refunding rent and those sorts of things. So um, just to recap though, the maximum that the, the lessor and the legislation allows for is four weeks in a fixed term agreement or two weeks in a periodic, but the tenant can offer more. 
That's great. Thank you. And I haven't seen any other questions come through in the chat. So just a reminder to anyone on there, if you have anything else that you're wondering, uh, pop a question in nice and quickly. Sounds like we might have covered all, right. all the... Might have... No worries at all. Well, with that, Ben, I will thank everyone for coming along today. Um, as highlighted throughout the session, our website does have a lot of information. And we'd recommend that you always download any form from our website to make sure that you're using the most up-to-date versions. So that is the end of today's session. Thanks so much for your participation. Please fill out the survey at the end as this will help our future outreach activities and help us deliver sessions that are useful and interesting to you. Take care and thanks very much for joining us today. And I will now end the webinar.